Mr. Mohan Gopal, as an academic and now as someone who is fighting constitutionally important cases in the Supreme Court, in the light of what uh, Dr. Isaac uh, pointed out, in terms of centers squeezing the powers of states and all that. This question is addressed to both of you, Justice Chalmeshwar and you. Do you think it's time we, we revisit the list? I mean, as you know, we have a central list, we have a state list, we have a concurrent list. Do both of you feel that it's about time we revisit the entire list? I think that's a very important question, but to put it in context, I think if we look at the subcontinent, I think we, uh, in the context of federalism, what we've seen over history is an attempt of various powers to impose a unitary form of polity over an extraordinarily diverse and extraordinarily fiercely independent, autonomous-minded uh, indigenous people. All those attempts have failed. There has not been one single power that has actually been able to impose a unitary state on this country, as they say in Vishnu Purana, north of the, of the sea and south of the Himalayas. They've never achieved that dream and they never will. They never will. So what we've seen instead is continuing attempts to, to create a unitary state and, and subjugate the people as an instrument of colonization. And so we look at this list, for example, as one more attempt to create space for a national entity, which we now call the union, in this space. But in this constitution, it's ultimately federal in nature. It's a Swaraj constitution. The first ten words of the constitution after the preamble are India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. Shall be a union of states. Not India, that is Bharat, is a union created by the merger of states. Which means sovereignty continues to vest in the state. And unless there is sovereignty in the state, their union cannot have sovereignty. And so we continue to be primarily a highly decentralized um, uh, polity uh, in reality on the ground, resisting this attempt to create a unitary state. Now, this, the mm, concurrent list uh, is a compromise, which is uh, in federalism, uh, shared sovereignty. And I was mentioning earlier to Bala that um, uh, Jürgen Habermas, the philosopher in the European context has been working a lot on transnational constitutionalism. And he has recently been working on a concept called dual sovereignty. And he argues that uh, European countries are nation states and there is a transcendental uh, constitutionality that is emerging at, as European Union. So you can be a national of your state and you can be a citizen of the, of the European Union. And he's saying this, he's calling this dual split sovereignty. And he says that is the new kind of sovereignty that they are creating where neither uh, the local unit nor the national unit is superior or inferior. In confederalism, the, uh, as you know, the, um, uh, the, the centr central unit is inferior to the local unit. In, uh, in devolution, the local unit is inferior to the central unit. But in this approach of dual sovereignty, they both coexist. And I think in reality, probably, in fact, I once had an occasion to meet Professor Habermas and I suggested to him that what you're saying is probably the reality of what exists in India. We do have on the ground a sense of dual sovereignty, that we have split sovereignty, together a composite sovereignty of the, of the republic, but both a shared sovereignty between the states and the, and the union. So I think the states are extremely important. The lists are extremely important. They should not be revisited or re rethought in such a manner as to further strengthen the union. But there will be a process, constant negotiation and interpretation. And the idea must be to protect the sovereignty of, of the states. And based on the strong sovereignty of the states, the strength of India, Indian sovereignty as, as a republic will only grow stronger, not weaker. So the, the, the concept of the list is a very, very good formulation from the Constituent Assembly. We just need to continue to work on strengthening democracy as the fundamental idea on which federalism is based. Mohan Gopal, may I ask you one clarification? Yeah, India is a union of states. Sorry? 
India is indeed a union of states. But today it has come to such a situation that the center can make and unmake states. You have the experience of Kashmir, which a state has been dissembled. There was a rumor and also controversy whether something like that was going to be experimented in Tamil Nadu. Fortunately for the country, they didn't pursue it. Now what is the remedy? What is the constitutional remedy? The challenge has come to the Supreme Court. In its wisdom, it has not found enough time to look into it. And therefore, what is the constitutional solution for this uh, challenge for the states? No, I think it's a very important point. In, in a nutshell, I will say that what, has happen, what happened in Kashmir is unconstitutional. It's illegal. That's my own view. And therefore, we cannot uh, argue from an illegal act and, and then understand the constitution from that point of view. After all, the, um, even in the United States, uh, there, there is a, the United States Supreme Court has, take, has taken the view that um, you can have secession only by either uh, revolution or a, new or, or a new constitution, but you can secede by consent. So all constitutional arrangements provide for some kind of rearrangement, if necessary, of the the units that comprise it, except that it must be done. The question is who is doing it and how. So theoretically our constitution says parliament composed of rep elected representatives from all the states, composed of an upper, upper house, a council of states, if all the states together by consent of the concerned state, with the full consent of the concerned state, in the interest of democracy, in the interest of the people, want to reconfigure the, 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 uh, the states, then our constitution is providing the possibility for that. But certainly even you, you use the word center, is interesting. It's a new usage, it's an administrative usage which has crept into the constitution. But the constitution only uses the word union. Whose union? Union of states. So if the union, the community of states come together and in the interest of the concerned state, at its request, at its demand, with its consent, wants to, uh, to rethink the status, then constitution provides us the flexibility for that. But that constitution, which is at the soul of it, is, is, uh, is democracy. Democracy means demos and kratos. Demos means common people. Kratos means power. So democracy does not mean simply election. It means power. Kratos is held by demos, common people. So democratic means with the consent of the people. And so it, that flexibility we should not uh, 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 misunderstand as authority from the constitution to unilaterally uh, get rid of a state. And that's why because of that, of, uh, it, it, I think such an action offends the basic structure of the constitution, the essential principles of the constitution. Uh, I think it's an illegal action. But um, I, I think, uh, do we have a remedy for that? Ultimately, uh, professor, um, a professor at Harvard Law School, he, he, he said that it is not the constitution that protects our fundamental rights. It is politics that protects our fundamental rights. And when you politicians allow a condition where the constitution can be overthrown in parliament and by parliament and disregarded in the judiciary by, uh, by people that you choose and appoint, directly or indirectly, then the constitution is, is orphaned and it has no remedy. So ultimately the solution lies with we the people through democratic politics. And so I should turn the question back to you and say what are your plans to restore the constitutional supremacy in politics? Yeah. I may mean, not be respond, but I would like to make a statement. Professor Gopal is uh, right in the sense the Indian constitution as it was drafted and as it existed with all the Sandan 
no, no, in fact, I forgot the number also. It's more than 100 amendments now. With all it amendments, the one basic tendency in the Indian constitution is it's part of it's part of the nature. Power always uh, seeks to consolidate itself and uh, expand. The scheme of the constitution indicates that more powers are to be invested in the union government. As Professor Gopal was pointing out, the word center was no, nowhere used, but there is a colonial uh, practice which continued subsequently even past the 1950. It is only the Union of India. Point is, when we are talking about federalism, all of us perhaps have some idea of an American federalism where the states got together to form a federation, independent state, which retained their sovereignty and parted with a bit of the regulatory authority to the federal government. In India, that is not the system. Because in America, if you take the American model, the, none of the existing states can be destroyed or totally obliterated from the map. Even American constitution provides for creation of a new state by merging different territories or different states uh, just, uh, of within the country. But then such a thing is possible only with the consent of both the states from whom the territory is sought to be carved out and then a special majority in the Congress and so on and so forth. If you look at the Indian constitution system, the text of the constitution, by a simple law of the parliament, an existing state can be obliterated from the face of the map. A new state can be created in the process you can, uh, the constitution provides for altering the boundaries of various uh, states and so on. A simple law. The consent of the concerned states is not required. and That's not the expression at all. Maximum the matter is referred to that particular state, a resolution, and how these resolutions are passed and even if a resolution is passed, what is the attention paid to that resolution in the parliament is a different question. Mr. OAC, you would know it better. You are a member of the parliament. I was a member of the parliament. <laughs> and you had a first-hand experience of what happened. I'm not saying it's a political decision to create or not create a particular state. The question is, did we follow what exactly is a rational process in this? These are the and these rational processes are only possible if the players in political arena Consensuously discharge their responsibility, constitutional responsibilities by properly debating the issue. Now, that's what, once a bad precedent is set up, it continues. It may happen in X state today, it may happen in Y state tomorrow, so on and so forth. Now, essentially, the tendency of the Indian constitution is to cre create more and more uh, power in favor of the union government. And in the process in the last 70 years, by on various occasions, wittingly or unwittingly, various or constitutional organs fell a prey to this trap. I'll give you one example. Now we have a common examination for entrance into medical colleges all over the country. This is not no part of the constitutional uh, scheme. Though education, though originally used to be in the state list, was shifted to the first list, but the concurrent list sometime in uh, 1975, I remember at 42nd Amendment or 41st Amendment, it was shifted. Education can be, but this move came from the Supreme Court. It was the Supreme Court which directed that it should be a uniform examination for the whole country, for medical intense examination. It is not the constitution or the parliament or any state government which wanted it. The MOOC, no. The value judgment was the Supreme Court judgment was right or wrong. Le legally it is final. There is no dispute about it. Whether uh, it is wise or not that way is a question which requires debate. If this country at different parts of the country at different levels of uh, accomplishment in the field of education you can't compare a child coming from Tamil Nadu to a child studying in Nagaland or Mizoram or some other state. Their accomplishment levels are different. Forgetting about within the same state, the different communities, different economic sectors, their accomplishments are different. But to create a, 
I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a much uh, example. It's an anecdote. Generally, an annual conference of all the chief justices is held in this country. I say generally because there are occasions when a couple of years they were not conducted. There's a different story. An annual conference of all the chief justices of the various high courts is held. The various questions are debated. There's a different story altogether. And one of those conferences which I had the privilege to attend, some proposal was made by the then Chief Justice of India. And with a, of course, uh, with a suggestion that all the high courts may consider, all the Chief Justice, it's a very, very civilized way of uh, directing the high courts. All the, the high courts may adopt this model. Then I had to tell the Chief Justice of India then, at that point of time, I was presiding over a high court as Chief Justice, which had its jurisdiction over seven states, seven different benches. Each one of the states had a permanent bench of the high court in that particular state. Seven registries, seven different governments, seven different sets of service rules governing the employees of the registry in that particular uh, bench. And then if you ask me to follow a model generated in Delhi, which basically is uh, generated on the basis of some experience gained out of UP or Bombay or Calcutta or Madras or Chennai, I'm sorry, Chennai, it, it's not going to work out that way. I had to point it out. Then, of course, the Chief Justice of India was great, then Chief Justice was gracious enough. Brother, of course, you form a separate uh, class, maybe you can... You can adopt the proposal to suit the convenience of your health. The point is this, what is valid in this argument is valid for every aspect of Indian political problems. It is such a huge country with, the, with the huge elements of uh, difference. The idea of federalism is the most suitable uh, idea for this country in view of all this diversity. The minute you try to centralize the whole thing, and create a model which you believe is good for the entire country, for all the states and all the classes of people, then we are into trouble. That is the trouble. Problem. On that note, uh, Justice Selma Shri, if I may ask yeah, you. Yeah. You have been part of the highest court of this country. You deferred with your brother judges on how judges should be appointed. It is no pleasure anyway. anyway. Anyway, so, and uh, the, since... The uh, academically, a very interesting proposition differing. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, it was a very interesting... Uh, professor yeah. uh, threw the ball in uh, Dr. Isaac's court. I'm throwing it back in your court. We grew up in the belief that the Supreme Court is a last resort for the people. Now, in the context of federalism, say, for the states. Please tell us honestly, do you think we are now in a situation where the Supreme Court can be considered as a last resort, where the interests of states and the people are going to be protected. We are hearing fabulous grand statements by other judges at seminars and workshops, but, the, but in terms of orders being delivered there, things appear to be different, or at least that's what a section Those of people believe. Those, those grand statements widely published by you and your ilk. Yes. It's because of because, it's because of you these statements come. Yes. Please I remember that. Don't blame anybody. <laughs> Just blame yourself. <laughs> anyway, but please, for the sorry. benefit of the audience. Yeah. Just to put you, it on you, the later huh? Yeah, no, no issues. Yes. For the benefit of the audience, what is your thought on this? See, I'll tell you. First of all, your question, please tell us honestly, even what makes you believe that I will not give an honest answer, I don't understand anyway. Now, <clears throat> question is, when you pose that question, the formulation requires a slight modification. You said the Supreme Court. I don't believe that there is a Supreme Court. There are 16 Supreme Courts in this country as of today. The highest court of this country doesn't sit and bank. What is decided by two judges sitting in a bench in a, uh, today or uh, this morning might be disagreed to with, by the another bench in the afternoon session. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm giving you the factual situation. So in which case, what Supreme Court are you talking about? I, I, I'm not saying it for the first time here. 
something uh, something like this i said it when i had the privilege of delivering late justice hr kanna memorial lecture sometime in 2015 in delhi and it's not i who invented it it all started long back justice hidayatulla former chief justice of india in this city delivering the first saraladi memorial lecture made the statement which became a two judge court he said nowadays it was unknown most of the important matters were decided by constitution benches and nowadays everything is being decided by two, two judges and next morning another two judges reverse it it happens because naturally if you have such a system where uh, if the highest court sits and bank on any issue a decision would be a decision of the court so it all varies with the individual no even then even when the entire court sits together there can be differences of opinion but the majority opinion would be one and that would be binding on the country when you have 15 or 16 benches of the supreme court every bench is uh, every decision of the bench is binding on the rest of the country so this is a system which perhaps requires some attention to be paid and something is to be done about it because without meaning any disrespect to my friends on the in, in politics people who are in control of the executive power would always love this kind of a system because it is always uh, uh, comfortable to handle situations like this if the entire supreme court of 30 judges or 20 judges were to sit together and decide the matter and if the judgment is not palatable to the government which over is the party it may take a decade or two before it can be reviewed because to proceed the 20 judges that is the earlier judgment requires a reconsideration because of xyz factors it takes a long time if matters are decided by two judges or three judges much easier to pursue a two judges or three judges that the earlier judgment requires a reconsideration because therefore nobody bothers about these things well what debating these matters let us debate about these things